We're holding our committee meeting here in the Capitol with one of our committee members, Senator Bates, participating in the hearing remotely with the use of video conference system. Uh, Senator Bates, if you are there, can I ask you to identify anyone that is in the room with you? Yes, I have my executive assistant, Ruth Strappen, here with me today. Thank you, Senator. Uh, returning back to our hearing process, uh, to allow the public access, we have admitted members of the public to two hearing rooms to the extent that social distancing requirements allow. We'll be using a teleconference service for those individuals who wish to testify today. For individuals wishing to provide public comment, the participant toll-free number and access code is posted on our committee website. It's going to be displayed on the screen right now before us. And that participant toll-free number is 844-291-6364. The access code is 924-1458. One more time, 844-291-6364 access code 9241458. When we move to the public comment, a moderator will identify you individually, open your line, and at that time you may address the committee. Note that in order for us to hear you clearly and to avoid feedback, you must mute the device you are watching the hearing on prior to giving your testimony over the phone. If you don't, we'll, we won't be able to hear you. It's important that we hear from you, so we uh, again thank you for your patience. So I will remain decorum, uh, maintain decorum, excuse me, during the hearing as is customary and any individuals who are disruptive may be removed from the remote meeting service or have their, dis their connections muted. While every effort has been made to streamline the hearing process and conduct our hearings in as close to the same manner as is customary, there may be some lag time for participants adjusting to the new online tools. So again, be patient and I thank you for that. Most importantly, on behalf of our stenographer, I'm going to ask uh, that all speakers, my colleagues and witnesses alike, speak slowly and clearly so that she is able to uh, hear you and transcribe. So having said all of that, Madam Secretary, let's establish a quorum. And members, remember, you'll need to turn your mics on uh, for the roll call and, of course, every time we vote. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bates? Here. Bates here. Hertzberg? Here. Hertzberg here. Laird? Here. Laird here. Wilk? Present. Wilk present. Atkins? Here. Atkins here. Colleagues, let me see if I can establish uh, uh, and get some of the items out of the way. Could I have a motion on item number one, the bill referral? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Um, anyone? Madam Secretary, please call the roll on item one. Bates? Aye. Bates, aye. Hertzberg? Aye. Hertzberg, aye. Laird? Aye. Laird, aye. Wilk? Aye. Wilk, aye. Atkins? Aye. Atkins, aye. Five to zero. Five to zero. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Let me see if I can get a motion on item number three, governor's appointees not required to appear. Item E, Laura Rambin, member of the Building Standards Commission. Also, Aaron Stockwell, item F, member, Building Standards Commission. A motion. Thank you. Uh, Senator Laird has moved. Madam Secretary. Please turn on your microphones. Bates. Aye. Bates, aye. Hertzberg. Aye. Hertzberg, aye. Laird. Aye. Laird, aye. Wilk. Aye. Wilk, aye. Atkins. Aye. Atkins, aye. Five to zero. Five to zero. Thank you. Those appointments will be... Uh, considered done and confirmed um, because they don't go to the floor. Um, let me, um, is that correct, Madam Secretary? They're confirmed? They, they are, no, they do go to the They floor. go to the floor. Okay, so uh, we are moving that to, to the floor. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to go back to governor's appointees. Item number two, we will move to A. And let me just thank those waiting in the queue. I know we have quite a few people uh, waiting to be heard today, uh, but we're first going to take up Ms. Carla Castaneda, who is the Chief Deputy Director, Department of Development Services, and I am going to say welcome to you, uh, offer you the opportunity to make some opening comments, recognize anyone that might be with you, your family, supporters, and then we'll go right to members for questions and comments. So welcome. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Senators. My name is Carla Castaneda with the Department of Developmental Services, and I am the Chief, Chief Deputy Director for Operations. Joining me today are my sisters, Lucy, Jessica, and Barbara, as well as my niece, Rachel, and my grandniece, Olivia, who will be 11 months old in a few days. Joining me remotely is my father and my nephews, depending on their school schedules. Um, I'd like to thank these folks as my support and, and strength when times are tough, but they don't hesitate to keep me humble when times are good. Um, I'd, I'd also like to thank my dad specifically for uh, his lifelong efforts to teach me um, the importance of hard work and perseverance. And my mother, who, although she's been gone about 10 years, uh, definitely taught me to look at things from another person's perspective and appreciate alternative points of view. I'd also like to thank Governor Newsom, Secretary Galley, and Director Bargeman in their confidence in selecting me for the appointment of Chief Deputy Director for Operations. And of course, our staff who just are so amazing and uh, diligent in all their efforts to continue to support our mission in maintaining services and supports for individuals with developmental disabilities. When I began with the department this spring at the beginning of the public health emergency, it, it, I was amazed at the efforts and the collaboration as we evaluated how to first and foremost keep individuals safe. Thank you very much. Very much. Um, before we go to the medical board, let me check in with our stenographer, Ina. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to go to the appointment of three members of the medical board. We have with us today uh, Dr. Dev Ganana Dev. Uh, I hope I said that correctly or as correctly as I can. Dr. Asif uh, Mahmood and Dr. Richard Thorpe. So let me say welcome to all of you and thank you for your patience. We will begin with introductions uh, from each of you. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Ganana Dev, and then we'll go to Dr. Mahmood, and then finally to Dr. Thorpe. Each of you can introduce yourself, make opening comments, acknowledge anyone that might be with you uh, that you would like to, and then I will go to my colleagues for questions and comments. So we will start with you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ganana Dev. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Senate Rules Committee. My name is Dr. Dave Ghana Dev. I am triple board certified vascular general trauma and critical care surgeon practicing for 40 years in San Bernardino, California. My entire 40 year career was spent at the only public hospital in the county of San Bernardino, that is the Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, including the, for the past 31 years as the chairman of the Department of Surgery. I was involved in uh, training hundreds of doctors, nurses, and other, other healthcare professionals. Working with the Board of Supervisors of my county, I was instrumental in creating multiple community benefit programs, including a free gang tattoo removal program for juvenile offenders, mobile medical clinic to provide healthcare to patients who have difficult time in accessing services in our large county, and cardiac rehabilitation program for indigent patients. This is my 10th year on the medical board, and this is my third and final appointment to the medical board of California. I do want to thank uh, Governor uh, Jerry Brown for uh, appointing me twice before, and Governor Newsom for appointing me this time. As the president of the medical board in 2016 and 18, I was instrumental in getting the medical board of California through Sunset Review. During my time, the board took actions to put through mandated training for board members and staff on both explicit and implicit bias training, and also took actions to mitigate the bias. The board created an iPhone app where the consumer can follow medical board actions on his or her, uh, all of his or her doctors. The board improved the quality of care by increasing the training requirement for doctors to get licensed from one year to three years, the only one in the country. When there was a stalemate in the legislature about patient notification requirement for licensees and probation, I was able to work with my board and, mem and the leadership of the BNP committees and assembly and Senate 
to get a compromise legislation passed. Medical Board of California is the first medical board to adopt in the country to adopt this. These are a few examples. If I approved my, by the Senate, I will continue to work hard uh, to protect and improve the health of Californians. That's what I dedicated my life to. And Madam Chair, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud. You need to unmute. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you. And uh, members of Senate, thank you for uh, taking me on this thing. And I really appreciate this opportunity. And thank uh, Governor Newsom appointing me and giving me this real opportunity to serve the state of California. My name is Dr. Asif Mahmood. I'm a practicing physician here in Southern California. My lifetime uh, passion and uh, desire has been to help and serve people. And that's what I do every single day. Not only I help people treating their diseases, but I get involved in every single challenge they face every single day. My practice comprises of, most of my practice comprises of minority patients, and that is by choice, because I want to help more those who really need help than those who are privileged. I have been trying to fight for my patients with the healthcare plans and IPAs and um, HMOs and uh, many other providers who are giving a hard time to my patients. And I believe um, healthcare is a right, not a privilege. And I also believe not only healthcare, quality healthcare, healthcare which has an accountability. And that was the reason I wanted to move on from where I am to the state level and be on part of medical board because I believe the real job of medical board is to provide a quality health care where there is an accountability. There are checks and balances. I would do my job if confirmed as fairly, as transparently as all my life have been doing. Nobody will stand between me and consumers and patients who need desperately health care and quality health care. We know that most of the physicians and providers in the state of California are doing the job in a tremendous way. But no profession is completely out of people who are called bad apples. And it is my job and my duty to make sure that no negligence happened because two things are the most important things in life, healthcare and life. And if somebody is negligent in care of patients intentionally or intentionally, whether their cultural views are different, if they're not applying the standard of care to the patients, I think we need to should, we should help hold them accountable. And that is where I will work every single day, like I have been doing ever since I was appointed, to take every task very seriously. And I want to establish a trust between people, the consumers and the medical board. I want to hear from people. They say, OK, we trust this medical board. I want to make sure we have a communication. Any patient, any consumer who has a concern should be swiftly and easily able to reach medical board. And medical board should have the resources to act on that in a timely fashion. And those consumers should be given the feedback. And all these cases should be taken in a very timely manner. I am a little passionate person. And I know board has been in the right direction. But I think there's a lot more to be done. I, in the end, I also want to thank my family who give me a lot of time to do all my work. And uh, uh, again, thank you. And I will be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Mahmood. Dr. Thorpe. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, um, Senators Will Bates, Hertzberg, and Laird, I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm looking forward to this hearing, and I and, and I, um, I I also want to thank God for this opportunity to to be here and be in this position. I'm grateful for my parents who. Um, gave me many opportunities, and uh, early in life, they never put limits on my dreams. Um, my family is um, online today, and uh, I want to thank my wife, Vicki, and our sons. She has been the wind beneath my wings for over 30 years, and without her support, I wouldn't be here today. Um, I've been a champion of quality health care um, 
my entire career. And, 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 and I am committed to, to that. Sorry, I just lost my notes. <laughs> I, I am uh, committed to that uh, um, being, being a champion. I believe that the bond between a physician and their client is sacred. And I am in awe of the trust that a person puts in their physician. I have great respect for that relationship. People have trusted me as their physician for 40 years, and I recognize how much medicine I've actually learned from them. And this is why I wanted to continue serving the public uh, in this capacity on the medical board. Um, and I am um, looking forward to your confirmation today. I've loved my patients and my entire career has been dedicated to saving lives and advocating for quality care for them. And now all patients in California. Um, I believe this appointment will allow me to bring my extensive clinical, administrative, and leadership experience to the consumers of California, and I completely endorse that role as a consumer protection advocate as the primary purpose of the medical board. Every day, my staff and I ensure that every person we, we see receives the care that they need, regardless of their ability to pay. Just this morning at 345, I was called by my answering service to talk with a mentally challenged elderly woman who had fallen at home. Her first thought was to call me, her doctor, before she called 911 or anyone else that could help her. In 2003, I was appointed to be the medical director of a single rural health clinic that was instrumental in providing care to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to care. Um, at that time, the clinic was seeing approximately 20,000 visits a year. And in part, I was responsible for the expansion of that clinic system to over four clinics, one of which was a 40,000 square foot state-of-the-art multi-specialty clinic uh, that provided excellent care. And now we see approximately, well, before the fire, we saw approximately 150,000 visits per year. I believe striving for excellence in care for all patients is true consumer advocacy. I spoke at the fire on November 8, uh, 2018 is a day I will never forget. Um, I've got very vivid memories of that day. Um, the campfire, as it came to be known, was responsible for the loss of 88 lives, making it the deadliest wildfire in the United States in over a century. After escaping the fire and relocating to Chico, I immediately took inventory of my family, my staff, and organized with my partners the ability to set up a temporary call center to care for patients who were displaced, which was over 14,000 homes were, were destroyed. In my role as the medical director of the Rural Health Clinic, I partnered with the Feather River Hospital and Adventist Health to man phones and ensure that my medical staff was available to, um, to, to take care of patients that were out of medications or needed additional care. Subsequently, we partnered with Blue Shield of California and, tele, and uh, uh, pioneered a telemedicine platform that was developed so we could, we could uh, manage these patients who were at a distance and couldn't find primary care where they had where they, they had escaped to. Uh, we have been fortunate to be back at our current location we're in Paradise since August of 2020. When five out of our six partners, including myself, had lost everything that they possessed, the next thought that they had was, how do we take care of our patients? And that's real consumer advocacy. I believe I'm qualified to serve on the medical board as a physician with a long and varied career. I've had experience as a primary care doctor, a specialist, interpreter of non-invasive cardiovascular and vascular studies, a surgical assistant, leader of a medical group for 20 years, and medical director of a rural health clinic for 15 years. I have held leadership positions in my hospital and county, state, and national medical associations on many levels. All of these experiences have given me great insight into a physician's activity and behavior and the ability to make difficult judgments. I love being a doctor and serving my patients and I love to serve my community. And I want to encourage the best and brightest young men, young, young minds, I'm sorry, to join this profession. In the 18 months that I've served on the Medical Board of California, I've learned a great deal. There was a very steep learning curve at the beginning. But I've also, on several occasions, advocated, um, well, I've generally agreed with the Attorney General's discipline, but there have been a few cases where I've advocated for more severe discipline. I voted for a fee increase for the licensees of the medical board, including physicians. And in fact, the bulk of revenue that is needed comes from physicians. This fee increase is critically important and necessary for the work of the board to protect the health of consumers and to ensure that licensing and regulation of physicians is done appropriately. 
I have and will continue to act without bias, judge fairly, protect consumers and discipline physicians who fail their patients. I thank my time on the board, along with my record of service and the trust that my patients have placed in me for over 40 years speaks for itself. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Thorpe. Uh, I'm gonna go to Senator Bates, who is participating remotely, and start with her. Am I muted? Here we go. Well, thank you, doctors, for uh, uh, stepping forward. It's a very, very important board that you serve on and that we, uh, I think, the consumer um, of California really looked to the medical board to solve some of the problems that have emerged uh, in the last uh, decade or so. An important one for me and my district, something I've been very focused on is certainly the opioid epidemic. Uh, we have lost uh, so many uh, young people from South Orange County, North San Diego County uh, due to uh, overdoses. Uh, certainly that's uh, the opioid uh, problem. And uh, the prescription review program is very uh, interesting to see that you have begun a very, very uh, deep dive into what uh, underlies that program and probably many doctors who have been over prescribing uh, opioids and, and uh, certainly those uh, get into the hands of the wrong people if even if they're going to the right person and we found that out so uh, I'd like to know um, what when you find the doctors that really are over prescribing uh, through that program that you have looking at the death certificates what steps are you taking as we go forward uh, is it an education program with our physicians uh, is it something that's related to enforcement? Because is it purposeful? Uh, is there some financial gain that's involved? Uh, could you give some comments on that, uh, all three of you, in terms of what you've seen in your own practices and in your own areas, and uh, what uh, you would like to bring to the fore that help us rein that in? Because it is not, it's not going away. It seems to be getting worse, especially with the uh, the synthetic opioid fentanyl being life, uh, uh, kind of in uh, put, putting, put into some of the, the very important drugs that help with pain management, et cetera. So uh, I'd like to hear from all of you on this because it's been a, a very, very important issue for me uh, during my Senate uh, term here. Thank you, Senator. Let's go in the same order, if that's okay, uh, doctors. Dr. Uh, Ganana Dev, do you want to start? And then we'll go to Dr. Mahmood and Dr. Thorpe, if you want to answer. Yeah, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Bates, I think it's an extremely important issue, and you mentioned all the all the actions we take. Uh, the first thing we did was that made sure that the cures uh, is mandated. Physicians have to log on to see if the patient is getting uh, medication from other doctors, so that way there are not multiple prescriptions. And uh, and then the you mentioned the death certificate project. We found 500 plus people who uh, uh, got the department of uh, the the our sister department sent us, and then we sent it to our uh, reviewers. And out of that, we are taking actions on people who do not follow the pain management guidelines. The pain management guidelines are put forward by us by CDC and by the medical association. So there are guidelines they need to follow. And if you look at it, actually the prescription drug uh, overdose deaths are decreasing right now. But what is increasing is like you mentioned, that is San Diego is the, uh, unfortunately it's where a lot of it through Mexico comes through, the illegal fentanyl. Illegal fentanyl is coming through and the danger with that is that uh, it could be twice as powerful as morphine or it could be 100 times as powerful as morphine, how it was made. So it's impossible for people to know what strength of fentanyl, illegal fentanyl they're taking. So it, it has been difficult. Uh, I, when I was actually president of the board, I even met with the DEA to see how they can help us and that needs federal, state, and local authorities to, to work together to really take care of the illegal fentanyl issue. But as far as the prescription drugs, 
I think we're on the right track. We still have a ways to go, and that's what we will. We want to continue to go there, and if we need any any legislative enhancements, we'll come to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, and I'll see what the Dr. Mahmood, what you want to add to that, and then Dr. Thorpe, what you want to add to that, and then we'll. If other questions come, we'll go in reverse order so that. Uh, so that the burden does not fall uh, on Dr. Ganana Dev completely. So, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, go ahead. Senator Bears, thank you. I totally believe this is the most burning issue, not in just California, in the whole country. What we are seeing every day, it is just uh, disheartening. Um, board take it very seriously. In last board meeting, we invited a. Um, one national figure on pain management to make sure even our board members are well educated about pain management. Dr. Granadev uh, uh, said, well, uh, that the problem is two ways. Number one is prescription drug, and other one is non prescription and called street drug. On prescription drug, um, I think cures that uh, system where we can check this patient is taking from with many, how many other physicians or providers that pain management so we can keep an eye on that. And death certificate program definitely has given us um, more leeway to keep a hold on that. But I think the problem is much bigger than just these couple of programs. I think we need to get onto our community and have some education program and reach out to our primary care doctors, reach out to our people who do the pain management even more aggressively. And I think there is, a uh, uh, pain management requirement for all the Californians, but especially people who are just doing the pain management, not anything else. They need to have more aggressive training and they need to pinpoint those people uh, in well ahead of time because a uh, lot of people who get addicted to the pain management or pain drugs, uh, Usually on the prescription drugs, they have some kind of problem, either surgery or fracture or something like that. And after that, they get on that and ultimately they get on the street drugs. So I think problem is very critical. Cures is a very good uh, uh, example. Death certificate is very good. Community education is very good. Periodic uh, uh, teaching on board's website and all other organizations who are playing part in community health should also be involved, and this should be addressed sooner than later. But I also agree with Dr. Ganadev that prescription drug problem is at least plateaued, if not getting worse. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thorpe, anything to add? Um, the only thing I would add is that we are, as a board, we are actually in the, the board's meeting uh, tomorrow and Friday. And part of what we're doing tomorrow and Friday is we're actually considering um, an updated set of prescribing guidelines. Um, and that's, I think, the last time we, we updated the guidelines was in 2014. And so we're um, anxious to see that go forward. The board has also taken a, um, a proactive uh, stance in this in that there were, um, there was a, a subcommittee of the board on prescription drug uh, prescribing and um, how to how to facilitate um, that combination of educating patients, educating educating physicians um, to try and preempt and to try and uh, continue to turn the, the ship. I think we have made a lot of progress. Um, there is significant improvement. I, I one thing would say as a caution is that I, I've taken care of a number of people who are in pain and who have uh, been requiring. Um, complex uh, programs, both in the rural health clinic, primarily in the rural health clinic, but also in my private practice. And and currently we're in danger of of, of be making it so, um, so socially distasteful for these people to be, to go to the pharmacy and, and pick up a prescription that it's, it, we're, we're in danger of actually harming some people who really have no other alternatives than narcotic pain medication for any kind of quality of life and be able to do their activities of daily living and function as a functioning adult. So I would just say that, you know, clearly we're on a very good path. I, I my goal is to try to ensure that we are um, doing all these things to make sure that the wrong people don't get the medications 
but still that people who need them are not uh, uh, disparaged because they are needing uh, these kind of medications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thor. Thank you, all, all, uh, all of you, for the response on that. And certainly, uh, I totally agree, Dr. Thorpe. We need a balance because pain management is so very important to quality of life. Absolutely, that people who need that can uh, certainly get it. It's just keeping it in the right hands and the people who are perhaps over-prescribing for the wrong reasons that they get better education. So that's uh, very good news that you have a new set of guidelines. And when you can share those, uh, I would like to see some of those because we have uh, some more legislation coming through. And if you have ideas that might help us rather than regulation, I mean, legislation maybe uh, helping with some of the regulations uh, would be very helpful. But thanks again, and I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. But to all of you, I again uh, congratulate you and thank you. Uh, great appreciation for stepping forth on a board uh, that's not an easy serve. <laughs> we know that. You have a, a lot of uh, challenges, and certainly uh, you, people love you, and people some like some don't like you very much. But uh, that's uh, part of the job. So thank you again, and I will be supporting uh, uh, your uh, appointments. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bates. I'm going to start with you, uh, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I would agree with my colleague. Uh, Senator Bates saying it's not an easy serve, and I thank you all for uh, your willingness to step up. And uh, Dr. Thorpe, I inspired by your comment that you love being a doctor. It's a good thing. We're in a situation where, you know, in California, in this great state of California, there's only a handful of us that are elected to create the legislature and a smaller handful between the executive branch and the constitutional officers. And so in order to run this great state, we delegate responsibility. We've come up with a way to delegate responsibility to folks who will step up and in most instances, like you are, substantially volunteering your time to help us to ha have a layer between the government and, um, and, and a group of folks that are experts. The great challenge that we face with respect to the Department of Consumer Affairs and the challenge that we face with your board and whether it's uh, architects or pharmacists or whatever, is that uh, we, we're trying to, as was indicated, um, uh, uh, to offer some level of consumer protection. There's a tension that exists between getting the expertise on the one hand, each of you are experts in your field, and the balance where it's not protectionism of the industry or the profession and has a level of sensitivity to the consumers. And so the reason I think that Senator Bates talked about how it's not an easy serve because in this area of public policy, it's quite difficult. And I have a couple of questions in that regard in terms of protecting consumers as we deal with that delicate balance, which is so important to us, which are just a handful of elected folks who are the ones who are ultimately responsible to the public. Uh, and we delegate that authority to you. And I want to start with uh, Dr. Uh, Garnenevdev, um, who's been on the board for 10 years. I'm informed that the average time from the recipient of a complaint from a doctor through the investigation to the issuance of formal discipline is 900 days. Now, I understand there's a series of excuses and processes and complexities. I served on the Board of Pharmacy some 35 years ago. You have the Attorney General. We have the Attorney General as our lawyer. And I understand some of those challenges. But here you've been on this board for 10 years, as you said in your testimony. And I want to get your thoughts as to why that's the case. Because certainly, as I said to you in the interview, having a patient waiting in your waiting room for 900 days would not be deemed a satisfactory experience. We need to have trust in the government. We need to have the public have trust in our process. And when something takes so long, it certainly raises the question about what's going on. So the question is your thoughts about what's gone before. And also, if you see any roadmaps forward to shorten that time so we can be more respectful to, uh, and, and responsive to the people that we all represent. So that went uh, to Dr. Ganada. Good yeah, right. Yes. yes. He's been there for uh, Thank you, Senator Hesburgh. I, I agree with you that uh, I wouldn't even like my patient waiting my, in my waiting room for nine minutes. That really bothers me if somebody is just waiting to be seen. 
So, I mean, you give you some numbers on uh, actual numbers, even though we are not proud of all these numbers, but 70% of the complaints are resolved, with, uh, are resolved within one year. And I'll give you the pending comply, the pending cases, the percentage of pending cases from 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19. Uh, 1670 is 1.84, less than 2%. And 1718, it's 5.81%. Uh, and 1819, it's 10.91%. So we do have a problem. It's not as like everybody is not waiting 900 days, but it's a complex process uh, which involves from the medical consultants to HQIU, to the AG's office, to the uh, plaintiff's attorneys, and, uh, uh, and the administrative law judge. There are multiple uh, uh, pegs in this process which goes through, and we are continuously looking at how to improve. And this sunset, uh, you'll be looking at it. We're asking several things uh, to make the process expedited. One of them is a better, uh, better resolution, uh, a better MOU between HQIO and medical board so that we can move faster. That's where its uh, highest amount of time is spent. Uh, also asking uh, uh, a penalty for when the, when the physician does not respond with medical records in time. $10,000 per day for up to $10,000. Also asking a cost reimbursement so that if there is a cost reimbursement, the attorneys don't drag on to really take these cases. So we're asking a lot of things. We need your help, but our goal is to shorten it as, as much as possible. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, can I have one more question? Yes, please. Yeah, I was going to ask the, the, the issue about the opioids, but I think that's been properly answered, and I thank uh, Senator Bates for that. Uh, this is to Dr. Thorpe. Uh, a 2016 California Research Bureau study uh, found that Latino and African-American doctors were more likely to have complaints, investigations, and disciplinary actions against them. How are you or how is the board ensuring that African-American and Latino doctors are not being unfairly punished in this process. Now, I know that there's been some implicit bias training that was referenced in the question, but if you can drill in a little deeper on that to be able to give us confidence that the process is fair. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Senator Hertzberg. Uh, yes, um, uh, I've been on the board for um, 18 months. It seems shorter than that somehow, but it's, that's what it's been. And, um, you know, as part of that, initiation, part of that um, training to be on the board. Um, implicit bias training was a part of that um, before, you know, before we could proceed with the, um, the, well, the confirmation, of course. Um, um, we, that, that whole idea of board training on implicit bias occurred because um, the president of the Golden State Medical Association, a association of uh, physicians of color, um, came to us and, and said, look, there's a, we're concerned about this. And we listened to her and we uh, have uh, taken out a couple of things that would be a clue to the reviewers as to what the background of the physician is, um, um, such as that we don't list the medical school anymore or the training programs that they were in before or the training programs that they were, that they uh, took part in. Um, and so I think there's a, the, the quality of people that are on the board currently um, are very focused on the idea of uh, equanimity and equality in terms of not disadvantaging any anyone for that matter, uh, either whether it's physician or or patient for that matter. But uh, I think there is, um, you know, there's always more that we can do. Of course, um, certainly we want to be open to any any opportunities that we have, but I, I do believe that the, that there is a real focus on, on trying to ensure that um, positions of color are not un, or inappropriately um, disciplined. Thank you so much. Is that all? Are you sure? Okay. More, okay, we, no, we, no, we, we may redirect after. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. 
And I want to commend you, Senator Hirschberg. That was quite eloquent laying out just how difficult these jobs are. Uh, so I want to congratulate all three of you on your appointment. Uh, I, ju I just I have a, actually a, a few questions. So uh, back in December, I had a very difficult Zoom call uh, with a, a couple from my district who lost a child and ultimately ended up filing a complaint with the, with the medical board. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details here because I know later in this year we're having sunset review of the medical board and maybe uh, I will do it at that time. But I do want to raise a number of uh, questions uh, based upon that conversation and, and like to get your guys' response. Uh, first one, how can the board improve the complaint process to allow for real-time status updates of the complaint and provide a primary contact along with contact information? I don't, I don't, yeah, whoever wants to, I don't mind hearing from all three, to be honest with you, but, I, you know, I know there's time, time concerns, so maybe one of you take that one would be great. Mr. Mahmood looks like he's... Uh... I, can, I can go on because I don't want to put all of them on the thing. Um, that is a real concern. That's what I said in my opening statement, too. And that is a really solid, real, logical concern on the behalf of consumers. And we need to do more work, although we have been improving, to educate people, educate consumers, Californians, if there's a problem, if there's an issue, how quickly they can reach out to board and there should be a system. I think there's a system in place, but I think response time is slower. How quickly board can work on that complaint and write, there should be a time limit that board get back to the family or back to the consumer with the answers at that time, what is happening. And after that, they should have, as you mentioned very appropriately, live update means that on a weekly or on a bi-weekly basis, give them the update, what is happening, where we are. That will not only satisfy the consumer, that is also is going to increase the trust in that consumer. Yes, the system is working, people are working, and that will also alert the board members, and they will keep an eye on this thing, yes. And also staff on the board. I think staff is tremendous. And right now, the constitution of the board is great, but they need to stay on alert. Okay, you know, these are the cases coming. They are important. Somebody's um, brother, or sister, mother, or father, or son, or daughter, or neighbor had this mishap happened, and we are not getting, and if we're going to wait for months and years, somebody might not even see the answer. So we need to really get more vigilant on that, and uh, mm, there should be a time period set on that. And uh, uh, my plan is to uh, really, uh, in this meeting or next meeting of the board, to move up this thing and have some homework done and uh, uh, bring a real uh, uh, transparent process in front so that people have more trust in the board. Thank you. Uh I'd like to make a comment, Senator Wilkes, just on on the, you know, the, the process, it's, it's very difficult because the process is so complicated. If there's a lot of things that the medical board staff don't have any control over, um, they don't really have any control or any updates from HQIU, who is doing the investigation. They, they don't always have up-to-date reports on what the... Uh, the attorney general's office is doing um, and if it goes to an administrative law judge then that's even more so even though we were we can be very transparent about updating from our staff and having a contact person on the staff to update the complaint it, it may not be very satisfactory because a lot of times we don't we don't know ourselves what's happening with that complaint and we would have to you know so we i think building in a more integrated um, working relationship between these departments that the medical board depends on, but doesn't really have any administrative control over, is a, is a significant part of streamlining this process. Uh, and that may be true, but I think even getting back to the family and saying we don't have an update this week, I think, I think would be helpful in terms of uh, building confidence and trust. So um, this is for Dr. Gnadeved. I want to follow up on um, one of Senator Hertzberg's questions. So. Uh, he asked you about the timeline, and I feel like you've, you've answered that. So in terms of uh, communications for the investigations, uh, the couple that I met with, uh, they're, you know, victims in this, and they were never interviewed at all regarding the submittal of the complaint. Is that, is that standard procedure, not to, not to interview those that have filed, and, and, if, and if so, why? 
Uh, Senator Wilkes, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, no, it's not a standard procedure. Actually, the staff investigators do interview. I'm not sure what happened here. I think we could uh, ask our staff, but they do interview uh, the families and also on the, on the updates. That's one of the things we are asking in this sunset where we get this continuous uh, updates from the HQIU as the investigation is going on. So that way my, our staff can inform the families where it is. So our goal is to keep everybody informed and absolutely it's not any, there is no place uh, when somebody suffers uh, for the staff not to interview their family members. Okay, thank you. And then uh, final question, um, I don't think it should take long, so I'd actually like to hear from, from all three of you. So in 2018, the legislature passed the Patient's Right to Know Act, which required the board to add a, uh, a probation summary to the profile pages of physicians on probation for acts of serious misconduct. In your opinion, do those, addition, do those additional efforts need to be made, do additional efforts need to be made to ensure patients are aware of physician misconduct or disciplinary action, i.e. use of a non-disclosure agreement? I appreciate uh, brief answers from all three of you. Thank you. Dr. Thorpe, why don't you start and then we'll go to uh, Dr. Gananandev and then uh, Dr. Mahmood. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yeah, I think those those uh, regu that regulation that that requirement um, is extremely important. Um, I believe those were specifically designed for people who for for physicians who were involved in any kind of sexual misconduct or were using any kind of um, substance inappropriately. Um, it, specifically, in those cases where these were thought felt to be significant potential harm for patients. Um, if they if they would have known that they might they would have certainly chosen another doctor. Um, I, I I do, you know I, I I understand where you're coming from with this. I I am a little bit concerned about the the unintended consequences of requiring every probationary doctor to be to to have to dif disclose that to their um, to their patients. Not that I, not that patients shouldn't have the access. They do if they go on the medical board website. That's clearly outlined on the medical board website. Um, but up front, when somebody is um, actually establishing a relationship with you, it's very chilling to um, to some people um, to say, "Well, what's what's going on? What are, what's your probation about?" I'm not saying that it's not a uh, idea that should be considered, but I am saying I think we've got to be careful about what the consequences might be of doing that. Okay, thank you. There are yes. two more, yeah, the yes. other two. And then I'm done at that point, Madam Pro Tem. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. Doctor, yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Wilkes. Uh, we actually, we worked quite a bit on patient notification from the probationary physicians with Senator Hill and the Assembly BNP Committee to really come up with this solution, which is egregious offenses. Actually, doctor has to give them on paper or orally tell them what it is about. For the rest of the probation, it is already on the website and with our app, which any patient can get the app, and they can see all their doctors right there. We are encouraging our patients, actually our consumers, to really download the app and take a look and see. Maybe the doctor was uh, had, a, uh, had a public letter of reprimand or a probation for uh, driving uh, under the influence a couple times, which had nothing to do with patient care, but had that. So, but that can be seen. So, uh, there is, the, it's it's available, and as we as we need anything more, we'll come to you. I, I think this is the uh, this is the biggest achievement we're able to do. As far as I recall, this is the only medical board in the country, which has that where uh, a doctor uh, for some egregious offenses, doctors have to, in person or in writing, notify every patient when they come to see them. Uh, to uh, uh, their why they are on probation. 
Thank you. Yes, I, I think the mobile app is a fantastic tool, but unfortunately, only I think about 13,000 or 17,000 numbers there, people have downloaded that so far. So 14 or 15 or 17,000 out of 40 million people is a very small number. So we need to advocate more people. Maybe in every doctor's office, we should put something that, okay, there's a mobile app available where you can get all the information. A lot of people don't have a computer. A lot of people don't have an access to it, but everybody has a phone now, so they can get from the mobile app, and that would be a lot easier when the patient is driving or finding a new doctor, they can get all the access. And um, California is on forefront to make providers who are committing bigger crimes, like sexual harassment, like uh, substance abuse, uh, and... Uh, in some serious uh, situation, they are, they are supposed to uh, notify their uh, patients. And uh, I think everything is on their website. Um, if, they, if that can be promoted, uh, then we can go to the next step that probably more needs to be done. I am up for transparency. Everybody who wants to come see a doctor, honestly, that is the most sacred relationship and patients should know everything about doctor, not about his private life, but about what he's doing professionally and what he has done in the past. And because their life and their uh, health lies in their hand, they have all the right to know about them. And I'm for it. If first step we can achieve, we can move on to next step. But if we cannot achieve the one which is very easy, go on to more details, I think it will be harder. So first one, the one which we need to, I think, push and uh, implement. Great. Well, I appreciate your answer. Uh, thank you all for your willingness to serve, and thank you, Madam Pro Tem, for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Laird. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thanks to the three candidates for being here today and, and willing to serve. Um, we have in front of us three vacancies today, and they're all in physician categories. <clears throat> and and there are three actual vacancies, and they're all in the public category. And I just want to note that the governor filled one of them yesterday, and, and, and that's great progress. And just we should acknowledge that everybody has their role to play uh, uh, based on their category. But I think my colleagues have done a great job at the granular level, whether it's opioids or diversity or response time. And I think I would like to ask each of you a more global question question that pulls it all together, which is that I think there's the concern that the medical board has to be an honest broker, that it is not captured in some way by the industry. And so how would each of you speak to that concern and how you would argue that that's not the case with regard to your service or your potential service? And I don't I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I don't know what order we're going in right now. Dr. But. Thorpe, do you want to um, <clears throat> go ahead and start, and then we'll go to Dr. Uh, Ganana Dev and then Dr. Mahmoud? Certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, would, I would say that, that you, yes, I have had, uh, you know, through my career, I've been active in the California Medical Association. There's no, I, I'm, I'm proud of my career there. I've done, a, I've done a very good job in many ways there promoting patient safety in that uh, position as well. But I, the idea that somehow I'm now um, forever, you know, kind of uh, under the influence of the California Medical Association is not um, not true. I don't talk to them regularly and they don't talk to me regularly. And my my role as as an advocate for consumers is really tied with my role as a primary care doctor. And my ethics as a primary care doctor is not my, it's not because I'm just a, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a doctor and I'm going to, uh, I mean, I've been involved in, in hospital peer review since the time I, I'm here in, for the last 38 years, probably, after I was appointed to the medical staff. And I've been involved in difficult conversations with doctors from, from that time on all the way through to, to today as a leader of a medical group, as a, uh, medical director in a rural health clinic, there are problems that arise. And, and as even in CMA, there are problems that arise. And having those conversations with uh, are very, some of, them, some of them very difficult. So there's, there's a difference between um, lobbying for a bill and actually advocating for consumers uh, today. And that's, 
where I would see the 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 differences. I I can tell you that my my focus is on serving the medical board and its its priorities in consumer protection, and I am not ashamed of that either. I'm happy to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganana Dev. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I I have done a lot of different things in life. Uh, as uh, I mentioned that uh, my entire career was spent uh, at the county hospital, taking care of and training doctors. Uh, I was even, I even took on to create a MD medical school uh, by raising funds, never took a salary from it. Uh, my thing is this, my community has been so good to me. I'm just want to give back what I can. And uh, my leadership roles in uh, whether it is California Medical Association or national level, it is all to add value to the best possible health care. When I took the oath on the medical board, my job was not to CMA, not to AMA, not to my hospital, not to my group, or not to any doctors. My job is actually to make sure that the, the doctors who are not providing highest quality of care are either uh, disciplined or rehabilitated, period. That's what really takes, that's what in the end provides the best possible care for California consumers. So I absolutely have no problem. I know some of the consumer advocates might have a problem, they think it is, but I don't because I have done multiple roles. Like Dr. Thorpe mentioned, as chief of surgery, I think many of the people I manage actually don't like when I point out to them what their quality of care is. As a trainer of doctors, when I point out to them that the, these are the mistakes they're making, they can't or they can't be in the program, they, they have an issue. But my goal is to provide the best possible care for the, uh, for the uh, California consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mahmood? So my really answer gets into my 20 years of uh, medical practice in California. As a medical practitioner, I have never charged a patient who did not have an insurance. A number is in thousands, because I believe helping people. I go way a step farther than just seeing them in the office or hospital, helping them to get some time the medication the companies are not authorizing. I have had several fights with HMOs and IPAs. I have been several times offered to be on board of the HMOs and IPAs, and I have turned down proudly. Um, my lifetime passion is to help people. Whatever, wherever, what I have done, the, my goal is to help people. Whether I'm doing this thing, whether when I was chief of staff in some hospital and uh, penalizing physicians who were not doing the proper work, whether I'm sitting in the town hall and talking against those people who are not doing the right practice, standing with the people. And um, I can assure you that nothing will, as I said in my opening statement, nothing will come in my way which will hinder me to protect consumers' rights and to protect Californians. And that is my whole goal, and that is my first and foremost mission, and that is the mission of Medical Board, and that should be the mission of Medical Board. And I'm, I will be happy to um, make you proud if I'm confirmed that uh, I will do the right thing as, uh, mm, as a humanist. Uh, I will try to fight for the rights of the people and real rights for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the answers to that question. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate very much my colleagues and the questions that they've answered. Um, I think this is um, a really important discussion. Um, you know, I, I read all of the letters that we received in support and the, the obviously the opposition and the support. And no doubt when we go to public uh, comment, we're going to hear a lot of people who are on the phone or here in support, and we're going to hear comments from people who are in opposition. I think the Rules Committee had a little bit of a preview of that when we uh, took up the appointment of the um, uh, director of the Department of Consumer Affairs because uh, that director is a former executive to the medical board. So we had a preview 
of some of the concerns, which is probably the nature of the conversation today. I guess, and, and I think I was gonna uh, basically uh, ask you about the, the balance of uh, the primary mission of the medical board uh, and how you balance that with um, your job as physicians. Uh, and, and you have to look at the, your peers who may end up before you in terms of some of the complaints. But I think my colleagues have asked uh, a good number of questions about that. What I would ask you is, do you feel like you actually have the resources you need to do appropriate investigations? When I look at um, the rundown uh, and to my colleague, the majority leader's question about the number of days and, and, and how long it takes to investigate, do you feel like the board has adequate resources for the expertise and level of skill of your investigators? And then uh, as those cases proceed forward, I think, um, give or take, I've tried to look at some of the numbers, maybe 11,000 or so complaints. You oversee the licenses of more than 160,000 physicians. And when you look at those complaints, how they proceed through the system, you really don't see a lot of those until, uh, until they reach a level that they come to your panels. Um, do you feel like that the uh, board has the expertise to be able to adequately have the investigations uh, be done thoroughly when you see those uh, cases come before you up against maybe medical experts of the defendants who come before you? Can you just, each of you, and I'll start with you, Dr. Thorpe. Well, actually, Dr. Ganana Dev, you have been on the board for 10 years, so let me start with you. Um, because uh, you've been there longer, I would just ask, do you feel like you have adequate resources to do the kind of investigation through to the Attorney General's office before they come to you? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the resources, first one is I will talk about the, the dues. Uh, we are asking in this sunset to legislatively pass the increase the dues to uh, $1,150. Uh, license fee going from 783. It's a significant increase, but our cost went up with both HPIU and and the AG's office. AG's office went up by 40 percent. So there is significant increase in there. So we do we do need those uh, as it uh, sunset uh, legislation comes forward. Uh, as far as uh, the personnel at the at each level. We're also asking you to help us to get our, for our staff to get the adequate and appropriate updates as these are being investigated. That's extremely important for, for us, for our staff to make sure that they inform, uh, they inform the, uh, the patients and their families. And when it comes to medical experts, I think this is where it helps to have a, a combination board where you have physicians and uh, public members. So I, quite a number of times, I, I, I explain to people as, as a teacher uh, for 40 years training uh, people, I can explain majority of the cases to my, to my panel members, and usually, majority of the time, uh, I, along with the other physicians, are the one who are pushing for tougher discipline compared to what ALJ came up with or what stipulation our own staff provided. So I think where we, our biggest resource needed is, uh, number one is uh, finances, number two is ability for our staff to get a, get uh, with both uh, HPIU and AG's office to really see where the investigation is at any given point of time. And it shouldn't be a rocket science because, I mean, in this age where everything is electronic, uh, even though we have to protect the privacy, but I think we should be able to get. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thorpe, let me ask you next. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
I, I um, well, Dr. Dr. Ganesh has clearly uh, outlined the problem. There's a really, there's a structural problem with the financial status of the medical board. The resources are bought by finances. Uh, if you hire an investigator and you're paying him a certain amount, and if you cannot, cannot keep with the part of the uh, industry, that investigator will, after a year, two years, learn things and leave. And then you will have start from the new person. If you keep them at a certain level, they would not leave. An investigator who is doing his job in first year or second year, if he's there third year, his job would be a lot more efficient and will be a lot more quality. Same thing, when you get the expert opinions, medical board gets expert opinions at a lower level of cost, whereas defendant or respondents get a cost five times. And obviously, those people are going to be spending a lot more time. That's why sometimes we lose the cases. So really, bottom line is more resources and financial resources. Everything else can be addressed if we can address that. And I think uh, there's a very timely uh, action being coming on the Sunset Review, which will come to you, and hopefully that will help us uh, do some good. Right. Thank you, doctor. I would think, um, you know, it, it was in trying to get to what you're handed as a board to review when you are dealing with an investigation, medical experts, you can be, uh, you know, if a defendant has more resources, uh, you've, you've got an imbalance of a situation there before something is put before you to make a determination. You're you're going to, I mean, granted, that's the benefit of having doctors who are able to be on the board and evaluate some of these cases. You bring your experience to that that maybe some of the public members don't have. At the same time, if you don't have the right legal expertise and investigative resources, uh, I mean, you know, we all face that. Uh, when I was at a city council and we had closed session to deal with litigation, uh, our city attorneys were sometimes outmaneuvered, uh, as I look at our attorney. So I, I'm just, I'm just uh, <laughs> curious as to whether there is a form of cost recovery that would allow you better expertise. But I'll, I'll leave that for a minute and just uh, ask one more question before we go to members of the public. And we will take a break at that point so that uh, our stenographer can 
let her fingers um, relax a bit. But um, you have as a as a body internal guidelines for levels of discipline, and you follow those guidelines. So whether you're talking about, I mean, I assume I'm going to ask you about that. You have guidelines for um, the type of disciplinary action you can take, whether someone is on probation for three, five, seven, I, I don't know what your guidelines are, but how often do you, uh, I mean, do you follow guidelines as outlined in terms of disciplinary action, or do you have the ability to um, change and, and give a lesser disciplinary action outside of your guidelines, and, and do you have a sense of how often you follow those guidelines strictly, or whether you give uh, less of a disciplinary action. And Dr. Mahmood, I will go to you first and let you start this time. Thank you. I think you brought this point right in the beginning of your statement and why what physicians bring more to the board than other people because everybody's healthcare related. And same thing is the case with that. Um, many times it happens that Physicians, because most of them are practicing and they know the problems exactly, and they are able to play. Play doesn't mean like manipulate. Play means that find out exactly why is this happening. A lot of time we come up and bring a question: why the punishment are uh, uh, is less? Why the accountability is less? Should be more because this is a very common thing. And times things happen when uh, you think that. This is a normal thing which happened, not normal thing, but this is a common thing which happens in the community. And if you start uh, reprimanding people for every little thing, then there'll be a, a lot of problem. The burden on us is that consumer protection is the number one mission and goal. And the second thing is physician or providers rehabilitation should be in our mind. And Sometimes you can play a little bit with that and you can come up with a better decision. Most of the time, when I look at that, I look at the guidelines and I try to follow the guidelines so that I'm not too much biased. But obviously, I bring both of these things that is this what is happening is unusual, very unusual. It is uh, uh, totally negligent and it's just an uh, unintentional error where somebody didn't get hurt, somebody didn't get really um uh, damaged, but uh, he's getting the thing. So things, in my opinion, things vary, but because of your medical knowledge and because of the ability to rehabilitate sometime and sometime punish them more. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'll, you I'll be glad to go next if you want thank me to. You. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. Um, yeah. The, um, so I, yeah, I think Dr. Mahmood has said it what, you know, well that um, I, th I would say 95 to 90, I, you know, probably 95%, maybe 98% of the time, um, the panel will uh, follow the recommendations of the, the AG or the, um, the administrative law judge, um, you know, because they, they, they're much closer to the case than we are. We review every case um, in detail, but um, generally, uh, when it comes right down to it, we recognize that that's their expertise. I think looking back, um, I, I'm just looking at um, some documents that uh, were provided to me by the staff. And in, in 2016, 2017, um, now this is talking about the administrative law judge cases. Uh, there were 81 decisions that were adopted without change, uh, six decisions that were um, uh, that have the penalty reduced in some way, and eight times that the board voted to increase the penalty in some way. Um, in in 2020, there were 43 administrative law judge adoptions without change, and one each. One of the administrative law judge decisions was uh, decreased, and one of them was increased. So it's it's. It's not very often that we that we change it, but we do have we do follow the disciplinary guidelines that are that are attached to every case. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor Ganana Dev. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, so actually, the, I think Doctor Thorpe and Doctor Mahmood uh, uh, stated, stated very clearly 
Uh, we do follow the disciplinary guidelines most of the time. Uh, ALJ, uh, because he, he, is a judge, he or she is a judge, and they usually uh, give us a fairly decent uh, recommendation or a judgment for us to decide. And uh, stipulation cases, this is where it comes in. And uh, interestingly, majority of the time, board wants tougher discipline on the doctor rather than what was stipulated by the staff on the AG's office. But then at about half of the time, the AG saw the attorney convinces us that, uh, by the way, if you don't take it, uh, these are the mitigating factors. It's not just the care. So you got to follow. So they will follow the attorney advice. So it's, uh, if you take uh, yeah, both the uh, the ALJ decisions and the stipulation, the actually majority of them uh, are, they go along with the guidelines. Thank you. Um, just a thought that needs no uh, response, but it seems to me uh, it, when we're looking at revenue and you're going to be going through the sunset review at our uh, Businesses and Professions Committee, cost recovery, particularly if there are egregious cases where violations are found, uh, could be one thing to consider and look at. I don't need a response to that. I think we can refer that, as my vice chairman said, to the sunset review process in terms of trying to help you figure out how you are going to have the resources uh, that you need. And I would say this body is going to have an opportunity to talk to a potential uh, attorney general appointee, at which point we can talk about their role, his or her role, in the advocacy of consumer protection and how to prioritize that in a way that makes sure that there is legal expertise available to the boards at the level that you uh, may need. We are going to take, uh, colleagues uh, and, and esteemed doctors, we are going to take a five-minute break, and then we will come back for public testimony, and then we'll conclude. So I thank you so much for your patience. I know how busy each of you are. Five minutes, everyone.
Thank you all for uh, your patience and allowing us to take a bit of a break. I'm calling the uh, committee back to order. My colleagues are here, and I see Senator Bates is also there. We are going to um, move to people, uh, members of the public who are here to testify in support. And I'm going to give a reminder to those that will be joining us via teleconference that the number to call, the uh, participant toll-free number is 844-291-6364. The access code is 924-1458. We're going to start with members of the public uh, who are here in room 3191 in support. And seeing no one in room 3191, let me go ahead and look at room 112. Okay, no one in support. We will go to Madam Moderator uh, on the teleconference. And uh, Madam Moderator, I will ask if you're able to tell me in advance how many speakers and support we have in the queue and to keep me posted on that. And I would remind individuals uh, to please give us uh, your name who you are representing, if anyone, and very brief comments. Thank you. Madam Moderator, are you with us? Yes, thank you. If you wish to speak in support, you may press 1-0 at this time. 1-0 at this time. And we do have uh, 10 in support, so we'll go to the first line of 16. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kim Stone of Stone Advocacy on behalf of the California Orthopedic Association. We support the mission of the medical board to protect healthcare patients through proper licensing and regulation of physicians and surgeons. And we believe that all three appointees, uh, reappointing Dr. Thorpe and Ganadev and appointing Dr. Mahmood, uh, we support those appointments and believe that all three are well qualified to serve on the board and urge your I vote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next witness. Thank you, and we will go to the line of 43. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brady Haynes. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Inlow Medical Center in Chico, California. I'm talking uh, for the support of Dr. Richard Thorpe. On November 2018 in Paradise, California, in Butte County, that morning the campfire started. It was uh, a tremendous uh, loss for our community, uh, our county, and our lost community members. As the evacuation occurred on the first day, all the medical community within Butte County and many other counties helped with the evacuation. The medical community of Paradise, which was burned out of all of their facilities, went down to Orville Hospital and Inlow Medical Center to help establish their patients. As I received a phone call from Dr. Thorpe, his focus was to quickly set up his group practice in Chico as fast as he could, and he needed help. He was focused on his patients that left their home without any of their medical support due to the fast-moving fires. By the second day of the fire, we established a plan and executed getting the sheriff to escort within the fire area to load all the medical equipment out of his practice to set up down into Chico. By the third day, his practice was up and running. The one thing that I didn't realize until the fifth or sixth day of that event was the traumatic stories that many of the community members and medical community in Paradise went through. All Dr. Thorpe was focused on was taking care of his patients quickly as possible. That is the Dr. Thorpe that I know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Thank you. And our next line will come from line uh, 37. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee. This is Adrian Mohammed with the California Medical Association. Uh, we want to say that we appreciate the committee taking the time um, and that we enthusiastically support the um, confirmations of Dr. Ganadev, Dr. Thorpe, and Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Thank you. And that will come from line 18. Your line is open. Hi, my name is Ken Kraft. I am the CEO at Hope of the Valley Rescue Mission, where we have 
nine homeless shelters in the San Fernando Valley, and actually by the end of this year, we'll have 14. And uh, I just want to uh, express my incredible support for Dr. Mahmoud, who has been not just a supporter, but he's been a friend of the mission. He, when he said earlier that his heart is to help and to serve people, we see it all the time, whether it's even bringing meals, bringing medical supplies, helping those that are injured and those that are sick within the shelters. He has a heart for those in need. So uh, we fully support Dr. Mahmoud uh, in the appointment to the medical board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness, please. That'll come from the line of 36. Your line is open. Ryan Spencer on behalf of the American College of OBGYNs, District 9, in strong support of the confirmations of Dr. Ganadev, Dr. Mahmoud, and Dr. Thorpe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness, please. Thank you. And that'll come to the line of 29. Your line is open. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tim Madden um, calling on behalf of the California Society of Plastic Surgeons, the California chapter of the American College of Cardiology, and the California Rheumatology Alliance. And all three groups are in strong support of the confirmations of Dr. Ganadev, Dr. Mahmoud, and Dr. Thor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness, please. And that'll come from line 49. Your line is open. Uh, line 49, your line is open. Do you have us on mute? And we will go on to the line of line 26. Your line is open. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This is Don Shinsky on behalf of the California Society of Dermatology and Dermatologic Surgery. Uh, wishing to express our support for all three doctors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness, please. Thank you. And that'll come from line 46. The line is open. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Tim Williams. I represent Adventist Health as a lead executive in Butte and Tehama counties to speak on behalf of Dr. Thorpe, personally to attest to his character of integrity, compassion, care, and selfless service to the patients in our community. I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Thorpe in various capacities over the last three years when I first came to Adventist Health. Specifically, we worked together in a leadership dynam dynam dynamic uh, where Dr. Thorpe was our market medical leader. Three areas in particular that I wanted to highlight for his leadership as it has impacted patient care in our community, patient quality, service, and safety. First with patient quality, Dr. Thorpe uh, was an advocate for our patients in meeting with providers of various uh, specialties to advocate for their care and experience to the degree of also having difficult conversations with clinicians and even ensuring that we terminated some highly skilled physicians because of concerns around patient safety, ultimately with the concern of delivering world-class health care to our patients. You heard Brady Haynes from Enlo Medical Center speak to service a little bit. In addition, in 2018 with the Campfire in Paradise, even after losing his own home, Dr. Thorpe put patients first with our Adventist Health uh, team. He rallied providers in support of our patients who were impacted by the disaster, not only ensuring they had critical medications, but were also connected to their primary care or behavior health teams and to ensure their ultimate safety. And finally, with patient safety, uh, Dr. Thorpe has been a champion for us in Butte County with our opioid epidemic challenges, internally leading an opioid task force, also collaborating with our Butte County Public Health to take on some of the challenges that we've faced here. He ensured that our patients were treated appropriately and had plans in place to taper them and also worked to uh, overhaul our policies and provider education uh, to track compliance. He was also uh, the chair of our patient compliance review to ensure that patients had an advocacy for their care and also on our outpatient clinical quality committee to review standards of care. And while Dr. Thorpe no longer serves uh, alongside us here locally with Adventist Health, his knowledge and experience as a physician are things that I still rely on for his wisdom. Thank you for your time and consideration and support for Dr. Thorpe. Thank you very much. Next witness, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our last one will be come from uh, line 45. Line 45, your line is open. 
Uh, Madam, Madam President, committee members, I'm Bryce Doherty here on behalf of the California Academy of Family Physicians and the California Society of Anesthesiologists in strong support of Drs. Thorpe, Mahmood, and Gananadev, all three of whom are fierce advocates for consumer protection and patient safety. Both California family physicians and physician anesthesiologists strongly urge your confirmation of their appointments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we have no one further in queue. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. We'll be back with you in a few minutes. So uh, having heard from people in support, we will now move to speakers in opposition. Uh, we'll start in here in room 3191, and seeing no one in 3191, let me look at room 112. Okay, seeing no one in room 112 uh, to speak in opposition. Madam Moderator, I am coming back to you. Can you tell me how many uh, folks we have waiting in the queue to speak in opposition? Yes, if you wish to speak in opposition, you may press 1-0 at this time. And it looks like we have six of them. One moment while we gather their information. Okay, and as we wait, I will remind witnesses to provide your name, organization, if any, position on the appointment, and to speak slowly and clearly uh, so our stenographer can hear you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, and we'll go to a line of 24. Your line is open. Hello, um, dear members of the Senate. My name is Ludmila Parada, and I am a resident of San Jose, California. In 2013, my husband, Mario Guzman, was injured by a series of gross negligence errors that rendered him a triathlete and a marathoner into a quadruple amputee at the age of 42. After filing a complaint with the California Medical Board against his physician, the investigation found the doctor at fault and sent his case to the Attorney General's Office for an accusation. We were surprised to see that a few months later, the case was dropped and the investigation sealed. To this date, the responsible doctor has an impeccable record, while my husband will require expensive, intensive medical care for the rest of his life at the expense of all California taxpayers. Like Dr. Thorpe, we lost everything, including our future or our health. Unfortunately, the California Medical Board made sure that we got no justice, because over 95% of complaints are closed without any sort of disciplinary action. During this process, it was evident that despite being a consumer protection agency, the consumer is the last consideration of the California Medical Board, even though said consumers are actual victims who have been maimed, hurt, and even killed at the hands of a few poor physicians. During this process, the patient is not only victimized by the medical provider, but by the very same organization that is supposed to deliver a modicum of justice. I was surprised to see that Dr. Gananadev was nominated as a board member. This is the very same man that nonchalantly expresses opposition to the patient's right to no act, as in his opinion, that disclosures interfere with the doctor-patient relationship, as it well should, because it is absurd that you get more transparency from your choice of restaurant than of the doctor that provides essential medical care for you. I am more horrified by the selection of Dr. Thorpe, a man that has presided over the California Medical Association and has been part of it for almost a quarter of a century. Unless Dr. Thorpe believes that the California Medical Board is now a branch of the lobbying group that is the California Medical Association, appointing him as a board member is like asking the robbers to guard the bank. The board, as it is, is a shame of a consumer protection agency. It allows terrible doctors to harm over and over again Californians of all walks of life, but often they prey on the most vulnerable of us when their misdeeds are such that their only choice to practice is to cater to underserved communities. These stonewall victims allows negligent doctors to practice with impunity, and Californians are the ones that pay the very real financial tap of terrible medical care. As you could hear on the public comments for support, not a single patient or victim testify in favor of their appointment, only doctors of members of multiple medical professional groups. To put lobbyists such as Dr. Thorpe or apologies as Dr. Gananadev in the board of the medical board is an insult to all victims of medical harm. And that is why I strongly oppose their appointment to the board, and I encourage you to do the same. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you. Next witness, please. Thank you. And that'll come from line 28. Your line is open. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sandra Perez, and I'm from Hesperia in San Bernardino County. 
I would like to first thank Senator Wilk for supporting me and my family, um, as well as the committee for hearing us today. I'm here today with my husband, Anthony, to speak on behalf of our family to oppose the appointment of Drs. Mahmood, Gananadev, and Thorpe to the medical board. We are victims of medical negligence. More specifically, our 17-year-old daughter, Jordan, died in 2018 as a result of egregious medical negligence. The current Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act of 1975 has defined our daughter's life as not worthy and of having no value. This law, despite efforts, has remained unchanged for over 45 years with the help of the California Medical Association, which these doctors were members of and have continued to fight. Jordan wasn't just misdiagnosed. She suffered at the hands of the medical professionals we trusted to help her. They failed. They failed us, and most importantly, they failed Jordan. An entire children's hospital and their providers ignored her symptoms, her test results, and lacked any coordinated care between specialties who continued to pass the buck and pass her along to the next doctor, most of the time without direction, diagnosis, or treatment. And the medical board did nothing about it after we filed complaints. In our opinion, the appointees contributed to the situation. No, they were not involved in her care directly they, as they never treated Jordan, but they have as lobbyists fought the laws and their foundation to allow us the ability to hold those who were negligent accountable and as board members failed to investigate complaints. As such, we believe the CMA, the medical board and these appointees contributed to the lack of accountability for professionals who commit medical malpra malpractice or egregious negligence, and we, the patients, suffer. After Jordan died, we filed formal complaints with the medical board. To date, not one investigation has taken place. Not one interview with us has taken place. All of our investigations but one were closed without any resolution, without any comments, without any discussion. We were advised the medical board would likely not investigate if we were in civil litigation, which we have to pay for out of our own pocket due to these appointees fight against any adjustments to MICRA. Every complaint that was closed was with exception to one. That one, I included a medically cited paper outlining our complaint. Nobody should ever have to do that. We do expect that this complaint will also be closed. I welcome and encourage each one of these appointees to contact me via Senator Wilkes' office if they wish to discuss. In January 2021, CBS News reported on an exclusive investigation into state medical boards, which found that state medical boards responsible for disciplining doctors who repeatedly injured their patients often failed to discipline those same doctors. For years, these appointees fought to allow patients harmed by medical negligence to obtain justice in the civil arena, protecting providers from accountability. Now they will sit on a medical board that investigates less than 2% of complaints submitted. Political appointees to the medical board, the medical board chartered to ensure patient safety and to hold doctors accountable is a conflict of interest, especially when those appointees have, for their years with the CMA, fought all attempts to allow the public to hold these providers accountable. Jordan's life was valuable. She is worthy of justice. I no longer trust the profession the medical board, nor these appointees to protect patients or to represent patient safety. As such, I respectfully ask you to oppose the appointment to the California Medical Board of Drs. Thorpe, Gananadev, and Mahmood. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Madam Moderator, next witness, please. Thank you, and that'll come from line of 33. Your line is open. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to address you today regarding my opposition to the appointment of Dr. Richard Thorpe and the reappointment of Dr. De Dr. Dev Gananadev to the Medical Board of California. My name is Tammy Smick. I'm a board member with Consumer Watchdog, and I live in Temecula, California. The mission of the Medical Board is patient protection, and it is outrageous that past presidents of the California Medical Association, a political organization with a long record of active op opposition to reasonable physician oversight are even being considered for this critical public safety position. 
my opposition to these appointees is very personal. I lost my 20-year-old son, Alex, medical negligence. While in a Laguna Beach hospital, his doctor ordered a lethal combination of medications and ordered that Alex's vitals only be checked while he was awake. Alex was given that toxic cocktail of drugs and left unmonitored for more than seven hours. He was found dead during morning rounds and he was already in rigor mortis. Um, seeking justice and accountability for my son's death, I turned to the courts but was denied access because of an outdated law enacted in 1975. So I turned to the medical board, trusting they would stop this dangerous doctor from harming another patient. Medical board investigators and attorney, attorney general prosecutors recommended revocation or suspension of the doctor's license. However, after a four year complaint process, a deal was made with the board and the doctor was let off with a public reprimand, a slap on the wrist. This discipline violated medical board guidelines and took place under the presidency of Dr. Dev Gananadev. Families like mine deserve a medical board we can trust to fulfill the board's mission of patient protection. We do not need a board driven by the CMA who would rather protect dangerous doctors than protect patients. Currently, there is no deterrence for a doctor's negligence, either in the courts or by the medical board. So I am looking forward to the Fairness Act on the 2022 ballot, which will update the cap on medical negligence cases and help hold doctors to account. Again, thank you for your time. I urge you to help protect California's healthcare consumers and reject the appointments of Dr. Thorpe and Ganana Dev. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, next witness, ma Madam Moderator. Thank you, and that'll come from line of 34. Your line is open. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Hello, my name is Olga Airy, and I'm from San Francisco. I would like to provide a statement opposing the appointments of Dr. Thorpe and Dr. Ganana Dave to the medical board. I'm also speaking on behalf of my sister, Shulpa, who was a research scientist focused on rare genetic diseases in children before a series of horrific and preventable medical errors at two hospitals ended her life. Patient safety and physician oversight are central tenets of the medical board, and yet both have been relentlessly weakened by the California Medical Association's lobbying efforts. Appointing another former president of the CNA will only strengthen the CNA's influence over the medical board and hinder much needed reform. We simply do not need another leader from the CNA on the medical board. If anything, the medical board needs more independent voices, particularly those from the patient advocacy side. I'm not a physician. However, I come from a family of physicians, scientists, and academics, and I have worked as a healthcare investment banker. I understand the challenge of balancing business needs with oversight and how extensive government regulations can cripple an organization or industry. However, I've also seen the ugly side of medicine when an industry fails to police its own and when physicians place their livelihoods over the care of their patients. Unfortunately, through its lobbying efforts to protect physician rights at the expense of patient care, the CNA has blocked reform that would have saved the lives of many patients in California, including my sister. The CNA has blocked all efforts to hold physicians accountable in any meaningful way. The CNA has helped create a climate in California where physician mistakes go unchecked without any consequences. For example, I have encountered physicians manipulating medical records to hide their mistakes. Physicians have demanded I stop asking questions as a prerequisite for an organ transplant listing. I have even been pressured to pull life support without being informed of key test results that confirmed physician negligence. None of this was legal, and yet it still happened. After I lost my sister, I turned to the legal system, but the current medical malpractice law severely restricts access to justice. I then turned to government oversight agencies like the medical board, but then learned how biased and inadequate their investigations really are. 
The medical board dismissed my complaint without action. The Department of Public Health referred a part of my hospital complaint to the medical board, but I never received a response. Time and time again, through my effort to seek accountability for my sister's death, I have been told that the medical board is beholden to the CNA. By appointing Dr. Thorpe and Dr. Gananade to the medical board, you are cementing the status quo. We need to bring fairness and integrity back into our healthcare system. We need more objective voices on the medical board and no leader of the CNA, let alone a current trustee, can fulfill that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next witness. Thank you, and that'll come from line of 41. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. My name is Rehan Shish. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Uh, will you repeat your name? I can hear you, but I, I couldn't understand what you said. Start again. Thank you. Yes, my name is, Re my, my name is Rehan Shish. Thank you. Uh, I am calling in support of all those three uh, doctors, Dr. Gananadev, Dr. Thorpe, and Dr. Asif Mahmood. I think they are very experienced doctors, and we need to give them opportunity to resolve those matters that some of those matters they are addressed uh, in today. Uh, my concern is uh, about the medical board process. There are certain matters about my, my concern is about authority of these members. Uh, in this meeting, Senator asked the question, it takes 900 days to complete the process. But these doctors, they have very little control over the process. It is the attorney general and the investigators who decide how long will it take and, uh, uh, and whether the members of the medical board will be able to hear those matters or not. Uh, in this matter, as you mentioned, that Latinos and Blacks are not fairly punished. But our, my concern is the persecution of doctors, especially Americans, Christians, Muslims, all the other categories, other classes. Uh, I have, uh, my wife and I, we have testified before Senate a few times uh, in 2013. Uh, for example, we gave a speech before Senate Senator uh, Scott Wilk was there. He was an assembly member. He was very kind to vote for us uh, in the favor of not uh, reauthorizing the medical board for the next four years. Uh, I am calling primarily, uh, I have over 13 years of experience with the state uh, uh, denying right to birth to a Muslim doctor, Dr. Fazana Sheikh in San Joaquin County, about um, in, I mean, it's been 13 years, and there has been not any hearing, not any trial before any board or before the medical board. So, so our concern is, uh, you know, not the protection of public, but the persecution of uh, selected individuals in the state of California. Uh, over 13 years ago, county supervisor, county hospital applied for her license after completing 24 months of residency training. And after two months, they denied the license allegedly, allegedly for not completing 24 months residency training. Sir, let and me, let me, let me, issue, let me interrupt for a sec. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear. You're calling in support of doctors, uh, Mahmoud, Ganana Dev, and Dr. Thorpe, but you will have concerns about other parts of the process. We have exactly so. Okay. I mean, I want to confine. I want to. I want to confine the the public testimony to the support or opposition. And I I did understand you support these three doctors. So if you can confine your well, comments well, to. Well, 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 the thing is that uh, well, the thing is that whom whom do we ask for right to trial? So these doctors, they gonna say, hey, you know what, they do. Who, who, is, who is authorized to schedule the hearing? Uh, so, so all I'm saying is that the process, they, like the doctor Throp mentioned about the budgeting, other matters, they don't have control over the okay. investigative portions or the attorney generals and the agencies. They are controlling uh, licenses and the rights of the people. I uh, understand. To, 
if if we have if we if, if we have problems with the attorneys for the department of justice or our local hospital whom do we go to so the dr shesh uh, over there she she re received um, you know stipulation you signed the stipulation sir, sir uh, i i need to i are. need to i need to interrupt you again i want to conf Firm, this is you are speaking in support, and that is good. I appreciate that. Other things seem not to be related to this uh, confirmation. So I would, uh, I thank you for your support and registering your support. We heard the other comments related to investigators, the AG's office. We will, we will address those issues in a different format through um, the confirmation of the next attorney general. Should we get that opportunity? So for now. I thank you for that. And uh, Madam Moderator, I would ask you to go to the next witness. Thank you. Thank you. And that it will come from the line of 30. Your line is open. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Marion Hollingsworth, and I'm a patient safety advocate in Southern California. I'd first like to point out that in the last 18 months, the disciplinary rate for the medical board under doctors Gananadev and Thorpe has fallen to just 3.5%. This is the lowest it's been for um, a long time. Um, I'm against the confirmation of doctors Dev Gananadev and Richard Thorpe as board members of the Medical Board of California. Both have an inherent conflict of interest and both have been president of the doctor lobby group, the California Medical Association. This group puts the financial interests of doctors ahead of patient safety in California. The CMA has been against each and every patient safety issue and proposition on California ballots for a number of years. Dr. Gananadev has personally financed the CMA award that gives $1,000 each year to a doctor who brings in the most new members. Both doctors Gananadev and Thorpe maintain active memberships in the CMA while on the medical board, which is a distinct conflict of interest. Uh, Dr. Thorpe um, earlier today also was not uh, completely honest when he said he was against the fee, uh, when he said he voted for the fee increase, when they initially brought that up, when Executive Director um, Kim uh, Kirchmeyer brought it up, he, he and Dr. Gananadev were uh, very much against any fee increase and made it very clear that they would not tolerate it. They only decided to vote for it when it became obvious that the only alternative was the medical board going into insolvency. Uh, Dr. Gananadev also gave the impression that he was for the probation transparency law, uh, but in October 5th, uh, 2015, he actually voted against it, and the following year, he also voted against another version. Uh, so he only voted against it. The board only decided to back the uh, patient right to no bill when it became obvious that it was an untenable situation following the cases, the very uh, public cases of Dr. Larry Nasser and Dr. George Tindall in their uh, sexual assault cases. Since it is such a gross conflict of interest to have Dr. Sinanadev and Thorpe on the medical board, I urge you to reject their confirmation. I don't oppose the confirmation of Dr. Mahmood. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, next witness. Thank you, and that'll come from line 38. Your line is open. Hi, my name is Eric Andrist. I'm a constituent of Senator Hertzberg in the Los Angeles area. I didn't realize we'd be limited time-wise, but I did send in a letter nearly a year ago, so please read that. I will just highlight some notes I've made during this hearing. Before I read you my prepared statement, I need to correct some of the misinformation these doctors have fed you because they've been less than truthful with you, and that alone is enough to keep them from serving on the board. One, the medical board follows their own guidelines probably less than 25% of the time. We have the evidence proving that. These applicants were not truthful with you about that. Two, it is not the standard of procedure to interview complainants. I filed a number of complaints on behalf of my family and other victims and know for a fact that they almost never interview a complainant before they close a complaint. They only interview it if it moves on to the next level. I'm sorry to hear that Senator Bates made up her mind before hearing the public speak. That is of great concern to me. My family has fallen victim to medical errors three times since 2003, and all of my complaints have been closed without investigation. And I now volunteer full-time as a patient safety advocate in honor of my sister's death. 
I co-run the nonprofit organization called the Patient Safety League here in the San Fernando Valley. We sent the legislature a report for the Sunset Review in 2014 called the Medical Farce of California, which went largely ignored, and we will be providing you more information for the next Sunset Review. You may not know this statistic, but less than one-third of California's doctors choose to be members of the California Medical Association. And of the third that are members, a portion of those are mandated to be members by their local medical societies. The CMA wields a lot of money and political power in this state, even though most doctors don't even belong. A few years back when Senator Jerry Hill was bringing forth his awesome bill that requires doctors on probation to inform their patients of that status, the CMA was very vocal in opposition to it. And likewise, Dr. Dev Ganadev, who was serving as the president of the medical board at the time, was also vocally not in support of the legislation. There's videos online of him in opposition. Ganadev also donates a lot of money to the California Medical Association. When I told the medical board about my personal medical negligence story, Dev Ganadev said to me on an elevator ride together that I should know better than to go to a bad doctor. After picking my jaw up off the floor, I realized that he has no clue about how real victims are suffering with the system and that a lot of people don't get to pick and choose their doctors. One of the doctors Deb is affiliated with in San Bernardino is Dr. Hari Reddy, who sexually assaulted a 14-year-old girl. Deb's first duty on the medical board was to sit on a panel that restored that sex offender's license. Reddy is the brother-in-law of Prim Reddy of Prime Healthcare, who went on to donate $40 million to Deb's new medical school. I am imploring you to not confirm these appointees. We need real patient advocates serving on the medical board, not biased doctors. A number of our advocates have put in applications to serve on the medical board, and they won't even consider us. We are trying to work with the medical board to fix all of its problems, but when our government keeps stacking the board with nominees like this, it makes it nearly impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrus. Uh, next witness, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our last witness will come from line of uh, 51. Madam Chair, this is Randall Hager. I apologize for appearing out of order. I have a support on behalf of the Psychiatric Physicians Alliance of California for all three physicians, uh, psychiatrists, either by reputation or through personal and professional contact, know each of these individual doctors for their high character, their professionalism, and their dedication to the patient's safety. And we commend them to your support. Thank you. Thank you. So for the record, that was a person in support of the uh, appointees. Uh, that was the last witness, Madam Moderator? That is correct, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, to all of the members of the public who spoke in support and opposition, I want to say thank you. Some of those uh, comments were difficult for us to hear, um, and I express my sorrow to you uh, for that. Let me bring it back uh, to the members of the of the committee to see if there are additional comments or questions at this time from my colleagues. Mr. Majority Leader, go ahead. Thank you, Madam. P <clears throat> Thank you, Madam PT. You know, I, I alluded in my opening, and um, <clears throat> Senator from Santa Cruz. Um, articulated better than I did of the issue of trust. The issue of being an honest broker, not captured by the industry, is what he said, uh, Mr. Laird. And what we heard, I think, um, in the tone, words, and temperament of the folks that were opposing um, was that issue keep coming back. For whatever the reason is, it's the balance that we have to achieve here. And so I in the most um, human ways possible, you know, where, where there was recommendations or the like. Look, it's hard. I, I, we have before here, uh, the, the professionals make recommendations to us, and, and sometimes we don't agree, and that's okay. That's our judgment. That's our job. But in order to inspire trust in the process, we have to do extraordinary due diligence to make sure that people understand that we have a rational basis for disagreeing with some of the professionals. 
uh, with respect to the recommendations that they make before this committee. And so I'd like to hear just very briefly that each of you, as you um, process the, the, the folks that spoke here and th this theme of trust, and it's, it's a larger issue that we've been facing for many years, as I said in the opening, uh, to kind of get your insights and your reactions to, not to the specifics of their testimony, but to the underlying framework uh, that Mr. Laird talked about of being honest brokers and not captured by the industry and when our job is to inspire confidence. If you could start with uh, whoever wants to start. Uh, Dr. Ganana Dev, let's uh, start with you. The longest serving member will go to Dr. Thorpe and then lastly to Dr. Mahmood. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, I want you to look at my entire life story, uh, whether it is where I work, what I have done, and what I have done on the board. And I have been truthful. I know people have an issue with I holding some leadership position about 12 or 13 years ago. I understand that. But that doesn't affect what I do on the medical board. Same as people have issues when we discipline a doctor in the medical staff or in, the, in my own department. So what I'm looking for is always, I looked at my entire career is, what's best for the people of California, period. Uh, that's because that's the way I was trained. That's the way I practice my entire life. Uh, what's good for my patients. So if, if somebody was bad to the patients, I'm pretty tough on them. So I, I, I understand some of them, some of them are pretty angry, and that anger is coming on us because we were there as leaders in an association which uh, often try to protect doctors, but also the same association also wants the best possible for the care for all Californians. So I, I don't take it personal. I actually take their comments and do what the best I can do to really get their trust. Thank you. Can I just modify, uh, Madam yes. Chair, the question as it goes to um, Dr. Thorpe. You, you know, I, I think he was involved with MICRA. MICRA is the, uh, I guess, the law dealing with uh, liability back and forth. Um, the MICRA, M-I-C-R-A, I think it's yeah. pronounced, yeah, MICRA. Um, and so um, you just you express, because there's some of these issues where some of the folks that testified were frustrated about the limitations um, of liability of, uh, because of MICRA and your role in MICRA, uh, if you can just share some thoughts and to try to inspire people of confidence that you're a fair uh, person in, with regard to dealing with the MICRA issue. I just want to hear from you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, so I think the, the question is my role in um, the fight against or to defeat Prop 46 in 2014. Um, and the issue was in part related to micro, but it was also tied with a couple of other things which were really not ready for prime time. The Cures database, for instance, at that time wasn't in fact, the, the Cures um, administrator admitted that if we were to make it mandatory for every doctor in the state to use that database, like we do today, and, and we encourage it and we teach it, and uh, both in, I mean, I teach it now, I've used it, I was using it in 2014, but it wasn't ready for the kind of prime time stuff that they were asking the, the legislature or the uh, initiative to do. So the, the opposition to the ballot initiative was the whole thing. It wasn't just the concern about the malpractice cap. Um, speaking, you know, I think there is um, there is a, a um, you know, this, this idea that somehow because I uh, was involved in that um, fight to try to um, overcome a poorly crafted bill that somehow I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't have the leadership capabilities or the ethics to serve on this medical board is an error and it's not right. Thank you for your uh, insights on that in the micro, I really appreciate it. 
Did you want Mr. Mahmood to speak to your question? Yeah, that would, that would be good. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Mr. Uh, Dr. Mahmood. Yes, I actually really would repeat my same answer before. I have nothing to hide. I have no vested interest in anywhere else. I am purely there to uh, protect and um, fight for the Californians and consumers. And I don't think so many people have any much concern on me, to be very honest. Maybe I'm newer and they haven't seen, but um, I have all my life stood up for people uh, at every step, and uh, I will stand up, and Californians and consumers will be my top priority, and their protection, their safety is the uh, goal of uh, my life, and uh, I'll continue to do that. Uh, uh, what I've been doing uh, on a local basis here in Southern California and statewide and uh, uh, hoping to make some difference in people's life in California. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Other colleagues, anything further? Okay. Oh, Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman. Uh, thank you, Madam Pro Tem. So uh, one of the people in opposition uh, shared that 95% of all cases are closed without any action. Uh, is, is, that, is that accurate information? Um, Any, anyone? anyone, yeah. Well, I don't believe that that is an accurate statement. The, the, the numbers are more, um, uh, I mean, the, the discipline rate is more like um, 8% out of the out of the complaints, I believe, rather than, it's not a big difference. I mean, it's true that you know, it's eight percent versus five percent, but that's I think it's a more accurate percentage. Okay, I know. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Madam Pro Tem, when uh, these nominations are coming to the floor, but I'm I'd like to maybe see the last four or five years uh, some kind of you know matrix of uh, uh, cases, and then. Uh, Something else that a number of people brought up, I actually asked a question, I wish I could remember which doctor answered it, but a number of people brought up that these cases are closed without ever interviewing the claimant. So I'd like to know, again, is that is that standard uh, procedures? And so if it is, and obviously it was violated in the cases that we heard today. Would anyone like yeah, the to? Two, the, the two that have been on the board the longest, I would appreciate answers uh, from. Senator Wilk said that's not the standard procedure. Actually, the investigator is supposed to talk to the member, the patients are their family members and get their perspective. So that's that's not true. If they did not, uh, I think that's a violation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Thorpe? You know, honestly, um, I don't know. And uh, I say, I mean, I've been on the board for 18 months, but I have, at the at the level that I get information, I I honestly just don't know if that's the case. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I um, think there's a little bit of information that we can make the request of of staff, rules committee staff, to follow up. Um, I would ask: Is are, are all of these numbers related to the number of cases investigated? that then go to the next level and the next level, the percentages. Is, is all of this public information? Uh, can can any of you, Dr. Ganana Dev, is, is this available to the public readily? Uh, yes, uh, Senator Atkins, it's, uh, it's presented at every board meeting and it's available to all the public. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I do think uh, I would like some clarity from the medical board staff related to the issue of whether uh, when there is an investigation, the complainant is uh, able to be consulted or have an interview. And so uh, to my staff who I know are listening, between now and, and should these appointments come to the floor, depending on, on the outcome today, I would like to know the response to that. So if we can get that information. I think what we have before us clearly these appointments are, are very critical appointments uh, to consumers and to the public. And clearly, uh, you know, we heard from some people today and um, it's hard for us in the position that we're in. We don't deal with these cases on a weekly basis. You're part of panels, you hear, 
you give of your time. And uh, clearly, we've heard from people in support, and we have heard from members of the public who have not had the best result for their family members, and that's always very difficult and hard to hear, um, I might add. Um, so it, it makes it difficult for us uh, when we hear probably those who are most uh, aggrieved. But um, I think that there is some really important piece here about the public's trust to the, to the point of the trust that the public has to place. And clearly, you're volunteers. You don't, you don't need to serve. You obviously have busy lives, so I appreciate that. It is a very serious responsibility to, to serve in addition to everything else you do. But it is an expectation, and so it is hard for us to hear from people who feel like the system has not um, served them well or, or addressed their concern. And, you know, they're not in the position to judge. That's why there is a legal system that allows them to do that. That's why there are other protections and, and institutions in place like this. And so that uh, public trust piece is very important. I think, you know, I would like... Uh, this has been one of the more um, in-depth rules committee hearings in terms of the conversation. Uh, clearly, we've had some difficult ones in the past, but this one has been more so. So I actually would like uh, each of you to, clo to give me some closing comments on your commitment to the public and your ability to balance these responsibilities that you have. It would, uh, and then we. I will move for a motion, and I will take separate motions on all three, just because there were people who made uh, comments in support of some, not all, as a group. So I think it would be better to just take each motion separately when we get there. But Dr. Ganana Dev, let me start with you to make concluding comments. Then I'll go to Dr. Thorpe, and then to Dr. Mahmoud. And I appreciate your patience and time, but I do think this is important. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I, I answered your questions. I actually uh, commented on what my mission in life is, uh, including from everything from public hospital. My role in CMA was small. My mission in, at the County of San Bernardino County Medical Center with taking care of uh, uh, minority patients is a lot bigger mission for 40 years. And my, when I moved to this community 40 years ago, 41 years ago, my wife and I moved in one small subcompact car. This community has been so good. Uh, I was able to build my group. I was able to convince the county of San Bernardino. In spite of the entire opposition from the entire hospital industry to build a county hospital to take care of the poor people. And so uh, my mission is not going to change. What, what, what that is the highest quality care for all the patients of California and medical board part is a small part. It is a part where I want to make sure that the substandard doctors are removed, are rehabilitated, uh, and uh, we increase the uh, education and the, uh, and the training of doctors so that you actually prevent from substandard doctors starting to practice in California. That's the reason we took three years of training uh, to get a license. So my mission here won't change, but I would uh, truly appreciate and uh, your, your support. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Thorpe? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just reaffirm what I said earlier, and that is that my um, my role on the medical board is that of a, a consumer advocate um, and patient protection. There is um, there is no way that I will be um, you know, deterred from that. That's that's been my that's been my pattern of action for the forty years I've been in practice is to advocate for patients. Um, I do think that there is a there is a balance to be had. Um, patient protection is is extremely important and needs to be the priority. But without a, without a profession, it's going to be much worse for consumers if you don't have a profession that is functioning at its highest level. And I um, I think it's important to have that 
that balance as well as and but I my um, I've said before that I I have um, I feel like I am uh, trustworthy. I don't come in with bias. I am willing to protect consumers and not protect harmful doctors. And uh, the real issue is, can you trust me? And I I realize you don't know me. Uh, you don't know me like the people that spoke on my behalf in my community. But um, I will tell you. I will pledge. I, you know. I will. I will state to you that my um, my, my pledge that I will be. Uh, dedicated to patient protection. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Dr. Mahmood. Um, the first and foremost and the sole job and mission of Medical Board is consumer protection and safety of our uh, Californians and deliver the world class healthcare standards to Californians. Um, healthcare cannot be delivered uh, in a high-class school level until there is an accountability. And I think I am, I'm not, a, I think, I'm sure that I would be ready to make any accountability if there is any breach in healthcare delivery at any level. And uh, as I said before, and I echo um, several of uh, our senators' uh, concerns about this. Uh, 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 things are not happening in timely fashion, and uh, that will frustrate me equally, as so many people are frustrated, and uh, we need to make some moves. Obviously, there are uh, uh, challenges and there are uh, trying situations, but I think we need to move beyond that, and we have to show a trend. And I'm pretty sure, once you show the trend that medical war is... Uh, moving in the right direction, people will trust us. And my goal will be to, once I get confirmed, to work aggressively on that, that people's voice is heard, people's concerns are heard, and not only heard, they are heard timely, and response is given timely, and people who are responsible for uh, their harm are uh, uh, disciplined timely, so that we can uh, continue to lead the health care delivery in California as a world standard. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Madam Chair, can I add one Yes. Question? You know, um, I, I just, I don't know if it's appropriate here in this context, but I think in the larger responsibility we have is that, you know, whether it's a board of pharmacy, the board of accountancy, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, every one of these boards that are regulated, I'd love to be able to see if it's possible how many cases, and if there's an aberration, maybe because of the micro issue, maybe because there's some other issue with respect to this board, uh, is there something different in terms of all, I think it's 40, I don't know how many boards, I think it's 41 or something boards under the Department of Consumer Affairs. I think Senator uh, Caballero used to be the head of that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so to get some sense as to see if there's an aberration because of micro or because of other issues and, and, and um, I guess, you know, larger sense, which would help us to see how this works and how the board is working in conjunction with all the other consumer boards that have similar responsibilities, just different areas of the law uh, and public policy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Madam, Chairman. Madam, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, yes. Oh, you probably have your hand up. <laughs> Vice Chair, I'm going to yield yeah, to Senator Yeah, we can yield to Bates, Senator Bates, Bates of course. Back to you. Of course. Senator Sorry. Sorry, uh, I don't have the hand up icon on this computer, so the states failed me on that, but it uh, gives me a chance to get my voice in. Uh, first, let me uh, share, uh, since one of the um, members of the public um, opposing the appointments was disappointed that I immediately jumped out with uh, saying I was going to support. Clearly, um, I was not aware of uh, this, this significant issues that they have brought forward in terms of probably most importantly, uh, the timing uh, and the lack of timeliness in getting uh, some resolutions to the issues that they brought forward. Uh, losing a loved one uh, through medical malpractice or alleged medical malpractice is horrific. Uh, I have many, many members of my family are in the medical profession. So I know the passion that they approach the job with, uh, the care that they you know, have uh, for their patients and uh, devotion. I mean, uh, somebody answering a phone at three in the morning to a answer a question from a senior who wants to know where to get their COVID shot, uh, those things are happening as we know. 
So I want you all to know, the opposition in particular, that I think what we heard today gives rise to looking for solutions. And, and there certainly is a legislative process in front of us that can help both sides of this question. We will be going through a, uh, a review, um, the sunset review. I believe that happens in one of our committee's business and professions, uh, perhaps. But we can certainly bring this information that you've provided us today, and I know it was very painful for you to do that, uh, to come forward and look for solutions in terms of resources that the board perhaps needs for more timely decisions, uh, whether that uh, the uh, review that goes on, uh, the vertical pro uh, prosecution or vertical enforcement investigation that used to be present that is no longer there, was that helpful to answer uh, the issues that have been brought up by the public? Uh, perhaps it was, but I think we need a deeper dive to take a look at these because one is too many. One is too many uh, when you lose a loved one and you do not get any resolution. So uh, I will continue my support. I, as I said, it's a very difficult serve that we've asked these gentlemen uh, who have incredible uh, backgrounds and education and devotion for many years to their patients uh, for them to, to bear uh, all of the uh, mistakes that have gone on before them and present, uh, we need to find a path uh, so that they can continue to, you know, exercise their expertise, but do that with some new parameters that they need to serve within. So I just want you to know that I always look for solutions and uh, my heart reaches out to you. Uh, those who oppose, and please know that I am committed to seek some solutions that this can't happen uh, so easily to any others that come forward with uh, complaints uh, on the malpractice issues uh, with their individual uh, physicians or health providers across the board. Thank you for that opportunity uh, for my remarks. Senator, thank you. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem, really quick. Uh, first of all, I think being a member of the CMA, that, that, that's a straw man argument. That doesn't, that doesn't carry any weight for me. To me, that tells me that these are people who are dedicated to their profession and, and want to be involved. Having said that, we can't have the Sunset Review uh, soon enough, as far as I'm concerned, on this board. So it, I, I'm fairly confident that it's not with these individuals, but maybe as Senator Hirschberg, you know, laid out, it's systemic and that we really need to take a look at that because, you know, you know, mistakes happen, but people do deserve justice. And, you know, based upon, uh, and I want to see more data. So I, I appreciate the pro tem asking for that because th that'll be really helpful. And I appreciate everybody's uh, participating today. And it was a very enlightening hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I will, before I ask for a motion, say a couple things. I do fully intend to have a conversation with the chair of BMP related to the Sunset Review and these outstanding questions that have come up that we will make sure and get uh, correspondence to both the medical board director as well as copying the chair of BMP, regardless of how a recommendation comes out of this body today for appointees go into the full Senate for confirmation. That is where the confirmation happens. So uh, I will do that. Um, I do uh, also want to point out that we have four more members heading our way from the medical board to be confirmed within the next couple of months. So, um, and I say that to the good doctors that are uh, here with us today because what that means is there is going to continue to be focus on the medical board right now. And so it isn't, it isn't just uh, three appointees today. It is actually more than that. And as I saw, I think yesterday, the governor made uh, a public appointment. Um, so I, I think that this is going to be an ongoing conversation because we have been uh, approached by members of the public, uh, a small number of folks today, but um, we have questions we need answered. Um, I do believe we should move this forward today. Um, I'm not certain how soon these will be on the floor for confirmation, but I want to give notice that the conversation is going to continue. And I agree with you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, people's involvement in an association is one factor, but people get involved because they want to be involved. And, it, and, and so um, I, I do uh, agree with you on that for certain. Um, 
People can apply to be on boards through the governor's office. The Senate has an appointment. The Assembly has an appointment. Uh, the Assembly and the Senate have public appointments. Um, I would say that there is a conversation. There are 15 members of this board, eight which are uh, designated by, um, by the establishment of the board, eight that are uh, from the medical establishment, and seven that are public members. Maybe there is a conversation we can have about increasing the number of public members so that they're at least equal or more than, given that it is a public protection board. And I would hope that you would um, support that as members of the board because it really is about your relationship with the public. You represent um, certainly the medical establishment in your roles and you bring that expertise, as I said before, but the members of the public have to feel that there's balance. Uh, and they are the ones who decide, you know, they're the ones who decide if we are doing a good job or not. I often say when, when someone wants to point out you're a leader, I'm like, I'm a leader if people agree that I am a leader. Otherwise, I am not a leader. And so I just want to point that out. It's not my determination. It's yours. So uh, with that, I'm going to separate each one. But I hope I appreciate the dialogue, uh, gentlemen, today. I hope you take to heart some of what we said. Uh, we take our job as seriously as you take yours, and, and so uh, certainly more to come. Let me ask if there is a motion on item number two, governor's appointees required to appear, number B. I'll start with Dr. Dev, Ganana Dev, uh, for a motion. Mr. Majority Leader, thank you. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Please turn on your microphones. Bates? Aye. Bates, aye. Hertzberg? Aye. Hertzberg, aye. Laird? Aye. Laird, aye. Wilk? Not voting. Wilk, not voting. Atkins? Not voting. Atkins, not voting. Three to zero. I will take a motion on governor's appointees required to appear. Item C, Dr. Asif Mahmoud. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Madam Secretary. Bates? Aye. It's I, Hertzberg. Aye. Hertzberg, aye. Laird. Aye. Laird, aye. Wilk. Aye. Wilk, aye. Atkins. Aye. Atkins, aye. Five to zero. I will take a motion on governor's appointees required to appear. Item 2D, Dr. Richard Thorpe. Madam Secretary. Oh. <laughs> I'll Sorry, I, I read your mind. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. A motion by the majority leader. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Eights. Aye. Aye. Hertzberg. 